In the early days of carrier aviation, aircraft were launched from a flight deck using a simple takeoff run, relying solely on the plane's engine power to achieve lift. This method was limited by the length of the flight deck and the weight of the aircraft. As the aircraft grew in size and power, it became increasingly difficult to achieve the necessary takeoff speed within the confines of a carrier deck. This limitation prompted the development of the catapult system. Catapults, initially hydraulic and later steam-powered, provided the necessary force to accelerate aircraft to take off speed over a short distance. The force developed by the catapult engine is transmitted through the drive system to the shuttle and then to the airplane by means of a component that is the focus of today's episode, the bridle. Usually V-shaped, but sometimes also in the form of a single rope, a launching bridle or pennant was essentially a steel cable used to transmit launching forces from a shuttle to the airplane. They are of a length suitable to obtain the proper line of force application relative to the airplane's center of gravity and to clear the airplane's structure and armament. The earliest bridles were relatively simple steel cables or ropes. They were primarily designed to withstand the forces generated by early catapult systems, which were less powerful than those developed later. These early bridles connected directly to the aircraft's landing gear or attachment points on the fuselage. Early bridles were typically made from high-strength steel wires twisted into ropes to enhance flexibility and durability. The steel was often treated to resist corrosion from the marine environment, but it lacked the sophisticated coatings and treatments developed in later years. The tensile strength and durability of these early bridles were sufficient for launching the lighter, slower propeller-driven aircraft of the time, such as the Grumman F4F Wildcat or the Douglas SBD Dauntless. As World War II progressed, aircraft became heavier and more powerful. New designs, like the Grumman F6F Hellcat and the Vought F4U Corsair, required stronger bridles to handle the increased launch forces. During this period, the steel used in bridles was improved. The introduction of higher tensile strength steel allowed for thinner cables that could still withstand greater loads, improving the efficiency of a launch system. Initially, the bridle was designed to be a one-time use and fall to the sea after each launch. At that time, bridles were relatively inexpensive and catapult launches were infrequent, since most aircraft could take off without assistance. However, as early as World War II, a simple device was designed to function as a bridle catcher, allowing the bridle to be reused multiple times. These were elongated tubes mounted on a deck parallel to the catapult track, just at its end. Inside the tube there was a rope, with a loop on one end and a hook on the other, which would catch the bridle. After the aircraft launched, a deck crew member had to reset the hook and retrieve the bridle. This simple device worked well with the hydraulic catapults. However, after the war with the introduction of heavier aircraft and jets like F2H Banshee and Grumman F9F Panther, catapult launches became more frequent, which required more powerful catapults and created a need for a new solution. This led to the development of the steam catapult, and the Americans soon realized that continuing to discard bridles would become a significant expense, especially given the large number of carrier operations. That's why in the early years of Cold War, Van Zelm company from Baltimore, Maryland 
developed a new system commonly referred to as Van Zelm Bridle Arrestor. One of its distinctive features was the characteristic sponsons on the bow of the carrier. And here's a simplified description of the components of this system. Two additional tracks were added along the catapult's main track. The primary and the secondary one. Both tracks extended all the way to the sponsons. A bridle shuttle was placed in the main track along with a slider. Two additional sliders were placed in the secondary track. The bridle was equipped with two lanyards that created two sets of connections. The one connected to the shuttle and the rear slider created a long connection. The lanyard at the front created a short connection. The shuttle in a primary track was connected to a strap, which wound on a drum equipped with a hydraulic motor and a system of clutches and brakes. And here's an overview of how this system worked. After the bridle or pennant is tensioned on the catapult, the petty officer in charge of hookup gives a signal to the bridle arrestor deck edge operator who activates the hydraulic motor connected to the drum. The strap rewinds slowly removing slack from the lanyards. The arrestor is tensioned and ready for the launch. During the catapult power stroke, the strap unwinds, rotating the drum, brake disc, brake cams and return cam. At approximately 100 feet of power stroke, low hydraulic pressure is applied to the brake cylinders. This brake force puts a drag load on a strap, preventing unwrapping at the drum due to centrifugal force. After approximately 200 feet, the primary cam opens the primary brake valve. The bridle begins slowing down, so it falls off the aircraft's hooks. After the bridle separates from the aircraft catapult hooks, it is smoothly arrested within 35 to 45 feet on the angled deck extension. The reason for angling was so the bridle would not bounce up and strike the aircraft as it left the deck. After the operation is completed, the brakes are released and the retraction phase begins. The strap is wound back onto the drum, pulling the bridle back to the starting position. The bridle is reused a fixed number of times, usually 30 to 50 before it's detached from the shuttle and the sliders and lost on the next launch. The steel used for the bridle was typically a high carbon alloy, providing the necessary tensile strength. The wires were often galvanized or coated with graphite grease to resist corrosion from the harsh marine environment. The tensile strength of the steel cables used in bridles could exceed 200,000 psi. This high tensile strength was crucial to handle the rapid acceleration and massive forces exerted on the bridle during the launch. The diameter of the bridle cables varied, but they generally ranged from half an inch to one inch in diameter. Thicker cables were used for heavier aircraft or those requiring more significant launch forces. The braking load or the maximum force the bridle could endure before a failure typically ranged between 50,000 and 100,000 pounds, depending on the cable's thickness and material. The bridles were inspected for broken wires after each launching. If more than two wires were broken, the bridles had to be replaced. Carriers carried different bridles tailored to various aircraft such as fighters, bombers and reconnaissance planes. Each type required a specific bridle design, with variations in length, strength, 
and attachment points to accommodate different landing gear configurations. However, the end of the bridle system was inevitable, mainly because it was too complex and unsafe to handle. The bridles had to be manually installed on the aircraft by the deck personnel, which had to remain in place to make sure the bridle remained secured to the aircraft until the catapult was tensioned prior to launch. If a bridle failed during the launch stroke, it could whip free from the catapult shuttle and fly in an uncontrolled fashion down the deck. This could potentially cause serious injuries among aircraft handlers and damage to the parked aircraft or equipment. And lastly, as an aircraft leaves the flight deck just after launch, the free ends of a bridle potentially could strike the aircraft underside, causing damage. Therefore, in the early 1960s, Grumman developed a new simpler and more efficient system, the launch bar, integrated with the aircraft's front landing gear. The first tests of the new system were conducted on December 19, 1962, using an E-2 aircraft. The tests were so successful that from then on, every aircraft intended for the carrier operations was equipped with a launch bar. As older aircraft that used bridles and pennants were retired, bridle catchers would begin to disappear from the US Navy carriers. The last carrier built with bridle catchers was the USS Carl Vinson, the third Nimitz-class nuclear supercarrier, which began construction in 1975 and was officially commissioned into the fleet in 1982. Over time, bridle catchers gradually disappeared from aircraft carriers as they were removed during deep maintenance and overhaul periods. The last active carrier equipped with bridle catchers was the USS Enterprise, which retained them until it was decommissioned in 2012. Bridles were also used by other navies. For instance, the French Navy for launching Supertendard Modernisé aircraft. Since the carrier they operated from, the Charles de Gaulle, was not equipped with bridle catchers, the bridles were discarded into the old-fashioned way, straight into the sea. The British Royal Navy also used bridles on its aircraft carriers. They were also discarded into the sea. However, one of the British aircraft carriers, HMS Ark Royal, underwent a major refit in 1970, during which it was equipped with bridle catchers. Another example was Brazil, which purchased an old French Clemenceau-class aircraft carrier, the Foch, in September 2000. It was bought without aircraft at scrap price and renamed Sao Paulo. The Brazilian Navy used old American A4 aircraft bought from Kuwait for carrier operations. This carrier also used bridles along with bridle catchers but it was decommissioned and sunk in the Atlantic in February 2023. That's it for today. If you like this type of presentation and would like to see more, please support this channel by leaving like or comment and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching and see you next time!